Good evening and welcome once again to Channel 514 as we continue our series Exploring Ancient Literature and what we will be doing this evening is bringing to a close our exploration of Egyptian literature and so we'll be reading some of the later tales from Egypt in this presentation or we'll be discussing them we won't read any of them straight through actually but these, as I may have mentioned before, were all written in the Demotic script. Demotic, that's D-E-M-O-T-I-C. That is a simplified Egyptian writing system that was used during the Hellenistic period and following. And there are several shorter, more minor works that we'll discuss, and then there are two major works that will take a little more time and so we'll we'll discuss the minor ones first and if necessary I may split this into two but I'm going to I'm going to try not to do that so first we'll go through these minor works and the first of these is called the fable of the swallow and the sea and this is an example of a text that comes down to us in the form of a writing exercise. And this form of writing exercise is known as a model letter. So scribal students would have copied this down as schoolwork. And the text itself, the original of it, was found, according to our translator Robert K. Rittner, as the last of four demotic writing exercises composed as model letters on a jug formerly in the in the uh, Berlin Museum where it had the serial number 12845 but it was destroyed during the Second World War now I'll read a little more from here because it'll give us an idea of what it's about oh there, there are some interesting facts in here actually that I want to get across the Berlin Demotic Fable, in which the futility of Pharaoh's threat to destroy Arabia is compared to that of a swallow's attempt to destroy the sea, also reveals cross-cultural influence. Later versions of the tale appear in rabbinical literature of the 4th century, and more fully in the Indian Panchatantra, attested from the 6th century. So, this same story can be found in Jewish rabbinical texts from the 4th century and in the Indian Panchatantra. And if you're not familiar with that, it's sort of the Indian Aesop. It's a collection of fables that revolve around a sort of mirror of princes theme in which a king or his advisors are associating young princelings or something. They're instructing them in the the ways of statecraft, so to speak, and what to expect from their experience of kingly rule that they're supposedly going to have. Anyway, that's the Panchatantra. That may, may or may not ever come up, really, in our series henceforth, although when we discuss Aesop sometime later on, we might come across it again. I don't, I'm not planning on doing a series on Indian literature of which I only know some really, some really well-known texts that a lot of people in the West read, so I may not get into that. Anyway, the fable of the swallow and the sea, what, what it's, well, the premise of the story is that there's an Arab chieftain, his, he's named here as Auski, A-U-S-K-Y, chief of the land of Arabia, and he's talking to a king, an Egyptian king, who is, he calls him Pharaoh with a capital P, but anyway, Pharaoh apparently wants to destroy or ravage Arabia. I don't know what they mean by Arabia, whether it means somewhere in, in Western Asia, somewhere in the area east of Palestine, or in modern-day Jordan, or whatever. I don't think he means the Arabian Peninsula, but Pharaoh is saying he's going to ravage Arabia, and so this chieftain tells him a story about a swallow who claimed that, or 
or threatened that she was going to scoop up the sea in her beak because the sea had failed to protect her eggs. And so, of course, the moral, the moral of the story, if you want to think of it that way, is that you can't do that, so Pharaoh is not going to be able to destroy all of Arabia either, and so there's our fable, the swallow in the sea. Now, another text that we have in here, which is also, I believe it's from the same jug, yeah, it's from this jug known as Berlin 12845 that was destroyed in World War II. It's called The Magician Hehor. And let's see, does Rittner have anything here that we should really talk about? No, not so much. But anyway, in this demotic literature, there is plenty of material about the adventures and exploits of famous magicians who either are purely fictional characters or who are based on people who lived in previous ages of Egyptian history. But this one, the magician Hehor, is very fragmentary, or our our version of it existing in the form of a model letter written on a jug that was destroyed in World War II is, well, I wouldn't say fragmentary, really, but there's not much of it anyway. So apparently this magician has been imprisoned. It says imprisoned in the prisons of Pharaoh at Elephantine, so somehow he has fallen out of favor and he's in this prison. And so a duck and a hen, they fly to the window of his cell, I guess, and they tell him that we are the two bird eggs that you have brought to life. So apparently at some other point in his career he brought some bird eggs to life or made them hatch prematurely or something. So it turned out they were a duck egg and a chicken egg, and so here are the duck and the hen, and they're, they want to help him get out of prison, you know. So they, they say, We request, if it pleases, that it be ordered that your words be written down on two petitions so that we might carry them and cast them into the columned hall before Pharaoh. So the birds are going to play the role of a carrier pigeon for this magician so that he can petition the king to uh, grant him an early release. Now, we have another fragmentary writing exercise from a jug. This one is called Jug Strasbourg and it's known as the childhood of Siosire, but that I think we'll save or we'll skip over it because this character Siosire is a major character in one of these other texts that we're going to deal with, a much greater one than this. And so this just seems to tell a little bit about him. It gives an episode in which He's in school, and he is somehow outsmarting the teacher who threatens to whip him. And that, that's something you find a lot in Near Eastern literature, sort of. You have this illustrious character, and they send him to school, and he somehow surprises his instructor with knowledge that he's not supposed to have, or by being to come up with pithy answers for things that the instructor says or asks him. So... You especially find episodes like that in the uh, the apocryphal infancy gospels and that sort of thing. But anyway, let's move on now. There's also a text in here called The Prophecy of the Lamb, and that's worth saying a few things about. It's also, it's from, let's see... It's from Papyrus Vienna D ten thousand and it was cut which was copied in seven to eight BC in the Augustan period. So this dates from the Roman period. I think those other ones that I just talked about also do. But it's also mentioned by the historian Manetho, whose work survives in fragments. And Manetho his work actually gives us the the scheme by which we usually discuss Egyptian history and divide it into different periods. So Manetho recounts all the dynasties, and so with modifications, our our 
account of Egyptian history and different dynasties begins with him. So anyway, that's not too important for our purposes here, but he mentions, Manetho mentions, that during the reign of Pharaoh Bakken Renef, or Bokoris, to use his Greek name, who is the sole ruler of the 24th dynasty, according to Manetho, in his reign a lamb spoke. So the lamb prophesied about the future of Egypt, and so that's what this text is about. It purports to be what the lamb said, so it's sort of an apocalypse, you could say, and I say that because what happens is that there's a supernatural occurrence in which the future is unveiled or the meaning of things is unveiled. So you could call this an Egyptian apocalypse in that sense. Anyway, it says here, our translator Robert K. Rittner tells us, The lamb, an emissary of the god Kunum, foretells the imminent overthrow of the king and a prolonged period of foreign domination and disaster under Assyrians, Medes, or Persians, and Greeks. A false savior will appear for two years before the rise of a national founder who will reign for 55 years, half the Egyptian ideal age of 110, under the control of the ram himself, now transformed into the Urias upon the head of Pharaoh. So anyway, there are different veiled or allegorical references to historical figures in here, and their identity is discussed by different scholars and different works, but anyway, this savior figure is going to return justice to Egypt and restore the shrines plundered by Assyrians and Medes, and of course that is something that Ptolemy I boasts of having done in the Satrap Stela, which we discussed in our video where we talked about royal stelae and other things. But So that's the prophecy of the Lamb, and I, I won't bother to stop and read anything from it, but it's an Egyptian apocalypse about the <clears throat> time following the 24th dynasty in which Egypt endured a series of periods of foreign rule. And anyway... The next of these would be the tale of Amasis and the Skipper. Now, Amasis is the last ruler of the 26th dynasty, which ruled from Sais in the north, and if I'm not mistaken, I think those kings were of Libyan or Western Semitic background, but anyway, I'd have to verify that, but it's not too important for us here. So it mentions here, Rittner mentions in his introduction, that this king's rule is described as severe in Diodorus of Sicily, the Greek historian, in Book I of his Library of History, at chapters 60 and 95, if anyone wants to look that up on the Perseus Project or whatever. But anyway, this is basically a satirical or comic story in which Amasis, the king, the last king of the 26th dynasty, as we said, he has a hangover. He's, it says he drank an extremely large quantity of wine because of the craving that Pharaoh had for a vat of Egyptian wine. So Pharaoh has a good time, and he wakes up hungover, and he says, It isn't in my power to do any work at all. However, look, is there a man among you who is able to recite a story to me so that I can derive some amusement because of it? And so there is a, a priest of Nath named Paneti, or Pet Sotem, according to another reading, and he tells of a story about, he says, a young skipper called Hormach Heru, son of Osorkon, who lived at some time in the past. And anyway, the story is this skipper is ordered to make a rushed cargo delivery to Daphnae, and he is certain that he won't be able to do this, and anyway, he can't disregard the king's command, and so he is very much at a loss and out of sorts, so he goes home and is in distress, and it says he, he was unable to touch her, his wife, because of the severity of the sickness in which he was, and so his wife says, says to him, oh, may he be cured from the fear of the river, and so I'm assuming the story would go on 
for a while after that, but anyway, he, the skipper is at home and thinking, how am I going to do this? And so that is as much as we have here of the tale of Amasis and the skipper, and it says here it forms the first column on the verso of the oracular Demotic Chronicle, Papyrus 215, which is at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. So anyway, and it dates to the early Ptolemaic period. Anyway, I think there are two more. We've gone on 15 minutes now, and there are two texts that I'd like to make sure that I that I describe fairly well and so maybe I will stop this here and make another so yeah that's not a bad idea so this was going to be our last video on Egyptian literature but we'll have just one more